Welcome to Shanama, Book of Kings. Today we continue with the tale of the reign of Castro Parviz. Balram and Castro met. The face of the one was open and confident, the other closed and apprehensive. The king, dressed in a Chinese cloak of gold work brocade, sat on his ivory colored horse. Gurdu proceeded as a guide, and he was accompanied by Bandai, Gostam, and Korad Borzin, who wore a golden helmet. They were all covered in iron, gold and silver, and wore golden belts studded with rubies. When Baram saw the face of the king, he turned pale with anger. He said to his warriors, So this miserable son of a whore has risen up from wretchedness and stupidity to be a man. He's become powerful and is ready for battle. He's learned how to be an emperor, but I shall bring his days in the world to an end soon enough. Look at this army from one end to the other and see if there's a single warrior there is worthy of the name. I can see no horsemen there who dare to confront me. Now he will see how men fight. Headlong horses, swords and maces, weapon blows and the hail of arrows, warriors' cries, and the give and take of battle. No elephant can keep its ground when I lead my army on an attack. The mountains tremble at my war cry, and savage lions flee. We'll put a spell on the waters with our swords and fill the desert from end to end with blood. Then he urged on his piebald horse, and it leapt forward like a winged bird. To his army's astonishment, he advanced to the river's edge and stood opposite to the young king. A few Persians, all prepared to fight against Castro, accompanied him. Kasra turned to his companions and said, Which of you can recognize Baram Chubane? Jurdu said, Your Majesty, look at the man on the piebald horse, the one wearing the white cloak and a black sword belt, who is riding at the center of that group of warriors. Seeing Baram, Kasra knew immediately what kind of person he was and said, You mean the dark, tall man on the piebald charger? Jurdu said, Yes, that's him a man who's never had a benevolent thought in his life. Castro replied, If you ask a hunchback a question, you'll get a rough answer. And can't you see that that man, with his boar's snout and his half-closed eyes, is obviously evil and an enemy to God? I can see no humility in him, and no one is going to be able to treat him as a subject. But still, hoping to turn the time from one of fighting to one of feasting, he addressed Balram from a distance. You're a proud warrior, but what are you doing here on the field of battle? You're an ornament to the court. The throne and the crown depend on you. You're a pillar of the army in warfare, a shining torch at feasts, an ambitious, God-fearing warrior. May God never abandon you. I have considered your position and weighed well the things you have done. I shall treat you and your army as my guests, and refresh my soul with the sight of you. Then I shall name you the commander of Iran's armies, as is just, and pray to God for your welfare. Baram heard him out. He let the reins in his hand drop and saluted Castro from his horse, then stood silently before him for a long while. Finally, he mounted his piebald charger. He said, I rejoice in the life I lead, and fortune favors me. I don't wish your greatness, because as a king you know neither justice nor injustice. And when the king of the Allens rules, it's the most miserable wretches who support him. I've considered your position, too, and I have a noose ready and waiting for you. Soon I'll construct a tall gibbet and tie your two hands together with my lariat. Then I'll string you up as you deserve and turn your days to bitterness." When Castro heard Baram's answer, his face turned as pale as fenugreek. He said, Ungrateful wretch! No God-fearing man would speak as you do. A guest approaches, and you greet him with curses when you should be welcoming him? That was never the way of kings or noble warriors. Neither Arabs nor Persians have ever acted like this. Not if you go back for three thousand years. A wise man would be ashamed of such behavior. Think again. Don't follow this ungrateful course. When a guest greets you kindly, you must be a devil to answer in such a fashion. I fear that I shall see you fall on evil days, ruined by your own obstinacy. 
Your well-being is in the hands of that king who lives eternally and rules all things. But you are an ungrateful sinner against God, and you'll bring contempt on your body, terror on your heart. When I say, I'm king of the Allens, you only mention a third of my lineage. In what way am I unworthy to rule? How is this crown unsuitable for my head? Neshen Ravan was my grandfather. Hormozd was my father. Who can you name who is more entitled to the crown than I am? The barm answered him, You're evil, and you talk and act like a fool. You prattle about being a guest, but your nature is wicked, and all you can do is repeat old stories. What do you know about kings, say? You're neither wise nor a good warrior. You were king of the Allens, and now you're a contemptible wretch, lower than a slave of slaves. You're the most wicked man in the world. You're not a king, and you have no right to lord it over other chieftains. The people have proclaimed me king, and I shall not leave you space on the earth to set your foot down. You say that the fortune is store for me, and that I'm unworthy of sovereignty. But I say that you're unfit to be king, and may you never occupy the throne again. The Persians are your enemies, and they'll fight till they tear you up by the roots and flay the skin from your body and fling your bones to the dogs. Khosrow said to him, You villain, what has made you so angry and insolent? Ugly talk is a fault in a man, and your nature has had this trait from the beginning. Fortunate the man who lives by wisdom. But wisdom has deserted your brain, and what a devil's hard pressed, he'll say anything. But I wouldn't want a fine warrior like you to be destroyed by anger. You should drive anger from your heart. Control yourself and put a spell on your rage. Remember, the just God who rules all things, and in doing so, make wisdom your guide. There's a mountain of trouble ahead of you, and if you look, you'll see it's higher than Bissetan. The desert thorns will bear fruit before someone like you becomes king. Your heart's filled with thoughts of sovereignty, but we'll see what God wills. I don't know who has taught you this villainy and these counsels of Ariman, but whoever it was wanted to bring about your death with his words. Then Kostro dismounted from his ivory-colored horse, removed the precious crown from his head, and turned lamenting toward the sun. His heart was filled with hope of God's grace, and he said, Bright Lord of justice, it is you who makes the tree of hope bear fruit. You know the slave who stands before me, and that one should weep for the shame he has brought to the crown. And then he went aside to pray, and opened the secrets of his heart to God. If I'm to give up my authority and see my lineage lose its sovereignty, I'll be your servant, and my one desire will be to tend your temple, sacred fire. I'll take no food but milk. The clothes I wear will be of wool and animals' coarse hair. I'll have no gold or silver, and I'll stay within your temple's precincts night and day. But if my sovereignty is to stay with me, guide my great army on to victory. And do not hand my crown and throne to one who's shown himself a slave in all he's done. If I achieve my heart's desire, I swear this horse and crown, the royal jewels I wear, my clothes of cloth of gold, all these will be devoted to your temple's treasury. Over your temple's lapis dome, I'll pour ten purses of gold coins. And when I'm sure that I am once again Iran's sole king, I'll add 10,000 more gold coins and bring the captives from this war so that they'll be your temple slaves in perpetuity. This sorely pressed man stood again after he had prayed and quickly went back to the river bank. He called out to Baram Chubane, You have no wisdom, no manners, no royal far. You're the hellish slave of some monstrous, irascible demon who has blinded you. You found rage and revenge instead of wisdom, and hell's demons applaud you for it. Thornbrakes seem cities to you. Hell seems an orchard. Wisdom torch has died before your eyes and taken all the light from your heart and soul. Some wily magician has raised your ambitions and show you the abyss. But the leaves of the tree for which you reach are poisonous, and its fruit is bitter. None of your family has ever shown such pride and ambition. God has not granted you the exalted position you crave, and you should not dream of things you can never be. A crab cannot sprout an eagle's wings, and an eagle cannot fly beyond the sun. 
I swear by God and by the throne and crown that if I find you without your army, I shall do you no harm. I have heard your savage language, but it is God who gives us victory, and him I rely. If I am not worthy to be king, I have no wish to live as anyone's subject. Balram replied, You are foolish and enthralled to Aramon. Your father was a God-fearing man, but you didn't respect him for what he was, and you pushed him ignominiously from the throne. You want to be a wise and capable king in his place, but you're perverse and an enemy of God, who will send you nothing but evil. It is true that Hormoz was unjust at times, and the land groaned beneath his oppression, but you're unworthy to be his son and to rule Iran and Tehran. You don't deserve a throne, or even life's good fortune has so deserted you that a tomb is all you are good for. I shall avenge Hormoz, and I shall be king in Iran. And tell me again the story that everyone agrees on, about how you thrust hot irons into the king's eyes, or that you at least gave the orders for this to be done. From now on, you'll see that sovereignty is mine, and I rule the heavens, from the sun to Pisces. Castro said, God forbid that a man should rejoice at his father's pain. It was written thus, what had to come to pass, and there is no point in discussing it endlessly. You call yourself a king, but when death comes, you won't even have a shroud to your name. You've your horse and barding, and because of these, you hope for sovereignty that will never exist. You've no home, no wealth, no country, no lineage. You're a king who's filled with wind. For all your army and wealth and false titles, you'll never know the splendor of a royal throne. <laughs> Subjects have never sought to be a king because they knew they were not worthy of the throne and crown. God created sovereignty out of justice, ability, and lineage. He bestows it on the most worthy person, the wisest and the most compassionate. My father made me king of the Allens, and I was troubled enough by you then. Now God has conferred imperial sovereignty, greatness, and the royal crown and throne on me. I shall do good in the world so that my name shall not disappear after my death. When Hormoz rules justly, the world rejoiced in his reign, and I, as his son, have inherited his throne, as is right, and with the crown and royal belt I have found good fortune. But you, you are filled with sin and deceit. First you attacked Hormoz, and all the evil in his reign was from you and your tricks and plots and lies. If God wills it, I shall avenge him and turn your son to darkness. Who is worthy of the crown? If I am not worthy of it, who is? Balram replied, You are a warrior, and whoever snatches sovereignty from you is worthy of it. The Ashkenans ruled when Babak's daughter gave birth to Ardashir. And isn't it true that Ardashir became powerful and seized the throne through killing Ardavan? But five hundred years have passed since then, and the Sasaian crown has grown cold. Now it is time for me to possess the throne and crown, and my victorious fortune will ensure this. I look at your face and your fortune, your army, your crown and your throne, and I stretch out my hand against the Sasaians as a savage lion leaps on its prey. I shall erase their names from the records and trample the Sasaian throne beneath my feet. If one listens to those who know the truth, it's the Ashkenians who deserve to rule. The truth is that you're a Sasanian, and your lineage is a contemptible one, because Sassan was a shepherd, and the son of a shepherd. Didn't Babak employ him as a shepherd for his flock? But Kostro answered, You ungrateful criminal! Was it the Sasanians who raised you up in the world? Your words are nothing but lies from me into the other, and no honor will come from such talk. Balram replied, It's no secret that Sassan was a shepherd, Kostro said. When Dara died, he was unable to bequeath the crown to Sassan, but through fortune turned against him, the race survived, and no justice will come from your unjust chatter. And this is the intelligence and good sense and glory with which you hope to gain the imperial throne? As he spake, he laughed, and he turned away toward his own army. 
were one of the three savage Turks, who were as wild as the wolves, and who had promised Barm that on the day of battle they'd seek fame by bringing the king before him dead or alive, rode fearlessly forward and flung a lariat of sixty coils which caught on Kostro's crown. Gostam severed the rope and his sword, and the king's head was unharmed. Barm turned on this wretched Turk and said, "'You deserve to be in your grave for this. Who told you to attack the king?' Didn't you see me standing there parlaying with him? Then he returned to his camp, his soul filled with sorrow, his body with disquiet. Vehemently, Gordia tried once again to dissuade her brother from his plans, but no avail. Baram attacked the king's army at night, and Khosrow Parvi was forced to flee back to Sesiphon. There he consulted with his blind father, Hormoz, who advised him to ask the emperor of Byzantium for help. As they were talking, news came that Baram's army was approaching, and Khosrow fled westward into the desert. Khosrow's advisers, Gostam and Bandai, remained behind, and unbeknownst to Khosrow, strangled Hormoz. Then they set out after Khosrow, who had taken refuge in a monastery. Baram's armies reached the monastery, but through a ruse of Bandai's, Khosrow was once again able to flee westward. Bandai fell into Bahram's hands and was imprisoned, and he managed to escape. Bahram crowned himself king. Khosrow, meanwhile, had reached Byzantium and entered into lengthy negotiations with the emperor there, using Gostam as his go-between. Eventually, the emperor agreed to help him against Bahram Chubanay. The emperor selected a hundred thousand of his troops, all fine men ready for battle, and these he assigned to Khosrow. Together with armor, cash, and war horses, in this way the king's long wait came to an end. The emperor had a daughter named Miriam, who was wise, dignified, and intelligent young woman. He affianced her to Kostro with the rites of his religion, calling down God's blessings on her. Goshtam received her from the emperor, and with all due ceremony, he handed her over to Kostro. The emperor presented them with such a dowry that the splendid horses carrying it were exhausted, by the weight. There were gold vessels and imperial jewels, rubies and clothes embroidered with gold work designs, carpets and Byzantine silk brocades bearing figures woven in gold. There were also bracelets, torques and earrings, and three splendid crowns encrusted with jewels. Four golden litters were prepared, their facings studded with gems as well as forty closed couches of ebony glittering with gems like a rooster's eyes. Following them came serving girls as lovely as the moon, and five hundred young male servants mounted on horses with trappings of gold and silver. Then there were forty handsome, charming Byzantine eunuchs, together with four wise and famous philosophers. To these last the king told everything that was necessary. He also spoke with Miriam in secret, advising her of obedience and her duties, on when she should be generous on her food, and what behavior was appropriate. When the gifts were reckoned up, their value was estimated at more than three hundred million dinars. The emperor consulted with astrologers as to when would be the best time for the journey, and set off on an auspicious day. After two stages of the journey, he gave orders that Miriam come to him, and he spoke with her at length, and he said, Keep yourself secluded, and do not loosen your belt until you reach the Persian border. Khosrow must not see you naked before then, since this could lead to unforeseen consequences. He then bade her an affectionate farewell. To his brother, Nyatis, who was in charge of the Byzantine troops, he said to Khosrow, he said, Mariam is of your own blood, and so I have entrusted her to you. I am grieving my daughter, my wealth, and a well-equipped army into your safe keeping. Nyatis accepted the charge, and when he and the king had spoken together, he wept as they turned aside from one another. Nyatis, bearing his sword and mace, marched at the head of the army. Kostro heard of their approach and set out from the town where he was waiting. As the dust sent up by the approaching troops became visible, followed by their banners and their splendid armored cavalry bearing down toward him like the wind, Khosrow laughed from his heart as a flower blossoms in the spring. His spirits lifted, and he dug his heels into his horse's flanks. 
he sang Nyadis and embraced him, questioning him at length about the emperor who had gone to such trouble on his behalf and offered him so much milk. Then he went over to the litter where he saw Miriam and glimpsed her face beneath her veil. He questioned her too and kissed her hand, rejoicing in his heart to see her beauty. Cosro brought the army to his royal pavilions where he had a private chamber prepared for Miriam. He sat talking with her for three days, and on the fourth, as the sun lit up the world, he had a splendid tent prepared, and there he summoned Nyadus and his subordinates, Sergius and Cut, as well as the other Byzantium commanders. He asked them, Who are your leaders, your finest warriors? Nyadus chose seventy men to lead the attack on the day of battle, and each of them had a thousand picked cavalry following his banner. When Khosrow saw his fine force of cavalry all eager for war, he praised God, who had created time and the world, and called down his blessings on Nyadus and the army, as well as on the emperor and his country. To the commanders he said, If God is with me in this battle, I shall show my mettle, and make the earth as splendid as the Pleiades. May our thoughts now be only of friendship. The heavens are with us, and the kindness of noble men is an orchard for us to rest in. Khosrow Parvi traveled to Arzibaijan, where the people welcomed him. Byram Chubane attempts to rally support began to fail, and there were a number of skirmishes between Bahram and Khosrow's allies. For a while, Khosrow became separated from the main body of his army. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends. <laughs>